let's take some questions today. We have some issues, I'm sure we want to deal with. Definitely. Um, for me, the first one would be, um, I guess, opposition pronouncements about, I guess, um, nepotism with the whole um, GPH uh, uh, contracts being awarded to members of the OSL um, and, um, what's it again? Is it not invest? I can't remember the other. Invest in Lucha? Yeah, the whole family friends. Exactly. Yeah. The fact that they are so aligned with, the, with this particular project and um, key positions being held by those individuals as well. What do you make of those claims of nepotism? And also that the um, GPH taken a loan from the OSL yeah. before. Mm. I, th I think if you sit down and you, you think about what the leader of the opposition said. Now let us start off with a very clear position. You expect the opposition to hold government to account. You expect the opposition to scrutinize the policies, the programs of the government. So you expect to hear criticisms. But the leader of the opposition is well known for character assassination, for vindictiveness, for being malicious. And they, I can speak about that. And every time I stand and speak before him, his testimony that he feels when he unjustifiably tried to do that to St. Lucian's, train qualified St. Lucian's. So let's analyze what he, he said. He attacks GPH for appointing a highly qualified St. Lucian. Somebody who had worked at Slasper, the Port Authority, as a senior executive. GPH gives him a regional job to manage their regional development program. As St. Lucians, you're supposed to be proud and say that an outstanding St. Lucian professional has been selected. Somebody with qualifications, not bogus degrees that they cannot prove that they have. Somebody who has had experience in port management. This is not somebody you're giving a bligh. This is a qualified solution, experience, and the know-how of what to do. Been given the opportunity to lead a regional investment initiative. I am proud of him. And I ask all the St. Lucian professionals to be proud when St. Lucians achieve the highest levels. I remember when you were in opposition, a former senior tourism executive in St. Lucia, who was dismissed by that same government, the United Workers' Party government, was vying for a regional job. He was prevented from getting it. There was also another St. Lucian lawyer who was going to get a regional job, prevented from getting it. How do you have a government, the United Workers' Party, that denies St. Lucians an opportunity to get regional jobs. And there are a number of St. Lucian professionals who could say to you what was done to them to make sure they did not get a job. I am proud when St. Lucians get jobs regionally and internationally. Trust me, and anything our government can do to support any St. Lucian anywhere in the world, we would do it because we're proud of our people. We're proud of what St. Lucians achieve, and we want to say to them. I was in Turks and Caicos a couple months ago, and I met with St. Lucians working with beaches by a friend of the Sanders property there, and they criticized me for meeting with the St. Lucians. Criticized me. I am proud that St. Lucians are managing and in senior management positions in other countries. I am proud of it. Why shouldn't I be proud for St. Lucians? So he's attacking a qualified experience and Lucian for getting a regional job. Now, why? Because he says the gentleman's brother works in the bank. The brother himself is a senior executive, a qualified St. Lucian. But why can't you be proud for them? Why can't you be? But he's doing that because he wants to destroy and he wants to pull down people. I think probably he should first of all tell us what qualifies him to be prime minister of St. Lucia. Maybe you should try that. But I, I don't want to go down that road with him. Let me just advise the lady of the opposition. Be, be glad for St. Lucians when we achieve. Proclaim St. Lucians when they go out there and they achieve. Collectively, we must tell our children, we must tell our relatives to aspire to get in regional jobs. 
and not decry them when they get it. That's what we should be doing. And that's what, when we speak about moving forward together, it's about saying, let's start breaking down those barriers of division and let's start promoting St. Lucia and promoting everybody else. The time will come when we will fight politically and maybe we will fight on differences in policies, but let's not bring down people. The Liberal Opposition criticizes and says there's an issue of major concern. And I'm listening, what's the issue of major concern? That GPH is getting a loan from a bank. Now, really? Again, stop and think. Just stop. Just stop. That's the same prime leader of the opposition who, when he was prime minister, all the reports suggested that NIC was going to buy lands in the north for the people of St. Lucia to own it. They were discouraged from doing so. And a foreign entity instead was facilitated to get the same monies from the NIC, our money, the workers' money, to buy the land. When St. Lucians got upset and there was such a national outcry, do you know what they did? They facilitated that company to get a loan from the local banks to pay off the NIC loan. Think about that, you know. The NIC loan was paid off with a loan from local banks. He was prime minister. Did he say he was concerned? He shouldn't be concerned. And you know why? Because investors come into the country, they need financing, they raise some of their financing overseas, they look for local financing to supplement their investment. And in an entirely private sector arrangement, they take their local loans. But why should they be concerned about that? What do you want the bank to do? Do not give loans? How can you make a, a private investment decision an issue, a national issue of that sort. But you know why he's doing it? Because he wants to destroy investor confidence in this country. Because when investors overseas hear that there is in St. Lucia elements that do not think investors should get any financing in St. Lucia, it will decrease confidence in ourselves as an investment dis um, destination. That's why he's doing it. The same reason why he announced to the world that DSH is in the process, or at least considering, taking the government to court over the DSH agreement that he signed. We never made it public. DSH never made it public. But he made it public. And he made it public just after he had a dance for his party at the same DHS site. Now, why would you, if you love St. Lucia and you care about St. Lucia, why would you in the first place even have a dance at DSH horse tables? And then for you to announce to the world that DSH is threatening to take the government to court, knowing that when he does that, investors will start asking, what's going on in St. Lucia? He's, he's calculated, he's wicked, and he's is a deliberate design to destroy the welfare of St. Lucia. I have no doubts in my mind on that. And he'll destroy any other St. Lucia who does not give in to him and succumb to him and is part of his cabal. That's how he operates. Listen to him further about GPH. He says that the government will give up $400 million over 40 years. Now we've met already. We've spoken about the GPH agreement. And I will go over it again. But just do a simple math for me. Say we have 750,000 visitors who come to, cruise passengers who come to this country. Say 750,000. In that same story he gave, and I heard the Hot FM story, it says the, the, um, the head tax is 5 US per passenger. Multiply 5 US by 750,000, how much is that? That's 3.5 million. Multiply that by 40 years, assuming it's 40 years, assuming, but it's not 40 years, but let's assume it's 40 years. 3.5 by 40 is how much? That's 140 million, no? 140 million. How did he arrive at 400 million? But that's the kind of Alan, Alan economics that he uses. That's why this country got itself into so much trouble. 
That's why he could have bought vaccines for $7 million and never got a vaccine up to this day. That's why he could have made a DSH deal and a cardboard deal and all the, the deals that were made with money in Panama and everywhere else. It's because that's how he thinks. How does 750,000 passengers a year paying $5 a head, which is 3.5 million US a year, by 40 years, which is 140 million, how does that become 400 million? Again, he's deliberately mischievous in what he's doing. And then he says the investment from GPH is about 20 million. They're taking a loan to pay off. But we know that's not true. That GPH is paying off the loan. GPH is developing the Castries um, port. And GPH is developing the Soufre waterfront. He knows that. But how would you know? If you go and buy a car and you take a loan at a bank, how would government know the details of your loan? How does government even get involved and know details of when people take loans? How much was the loan for um, Coco Pam? Where did Coco Pam get the, get the loan from? What was the interest rate? Have they paid off the loan? Have they defaulted? Who knows? So it's a private company. It's a private company. No. Precisely. When Julian bought over Julian, you remember this story? There used to be a supermarket, Julian, that used to rob every weekend, and then locally a company bought it over and tra transferred it to Julian, owned by um, the, um, a local businessman. Did anybody know how much they paid for the loan? How much they paid for it? What are the details of the loan? We don't know. These are private engagements. No, let's put it differently. A private company goes to a private lending institution to take a loan to finance their investment. That has nothing to do with government. So can we say this is something normal? In the it, hap it happens every day. Which we know opposition, whether it's you ever in opposition or the current opposition, can ever say that there is something wrong when an investor comes in to do and does something like that. It happens all the time. This is absolutely normal. Investors come in and they obtain loans from local financing institutions. You, you, you don't ask. When they apply for concessions, you'll ask them about their financing. They will say 70% is from this bank in New York or this bank in London, 25% from local sources, whatnot. You don't ask them what's your interest rate, what's your monthly repayment. You don't ask people those things. So don't make it look as if you know, there's an issue. But he's doing it because he wants investors to start questioning whether they should come to St. Lucia. That's why it's been done. So why would, <coughs> I mean, we don't live in his mind, but why would someone deliberately attempt to undermine investor confidence by the same time want to be the leader of the country? Because, because it's the lust for power, the obsession with power. And let me tell you, if the leader of the opposition ever comes back as prime minister in this country, a lot of people will pay a heavy price Trust me, the maliciousness, the deviousness will be unmatched in the history of the Caribbean because that's the nature of the individual. So if I can destroy it, throw the baby out of the, the water, and then maybe I'll get a chance to rebuild it and rebuild it after my own image. They might, pl they might flog all of you all out in the square, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, from all indications, our um, outlook for Q4 is going to be quite strong, really strong, and we're hoping to end the year even stronger than we did last year. We had a rough summer. Um, our numbers were down slightly. And because there were a lot of equipment issues with some of the airlines. So a lot of the meetings we had a couple of weeks ago, was it last week, last week, was about planning for next summer.
to make sure we do not have some of the same issues that we've that we we had this year um, so we'll have a very strong q4 and q1 next year and we will build up to the summer next year summer looks to be quite exciting we have jazz we have world cup cricket we have carnival we have emancipation so we, we will have a, on cpl a strong summer but we need to make sure we have the seats the connectivity so we we are um, finalizing with virgin we finalizing with british airways british airways has been strong with us daily flights right through so they, they continue to be a strong supporter of ours um, we have commitments from you know the United, um, american airlines that they will increase the number of seats um, and announcements will be made publicly once everything is signed off but yes um, a lot of discussions and work is going into securing um, more seats for st lucia and you know next year is going to be a big year if you believe the opposition um, has made noise. Wait till next year, and especially when the Prime Minister announces his budget next year. I think some of them will lose their sanity because, you know, the, the projects and the, the activities that will take off next year uh, will frighten them. But I think we're working very hard to make sure we have everything in place for, for next year. Yeah, just to follow up on that, there was all, you also had some talks with the uh, Saudi Tourism Authority. Yes, uh, yes. What, what was that about? Well, again, it's building the, the relationship further. The Saudi has made money available for us to complete St. Jude's and to refurbish the George Odlam Stadium. And of course, the works are proceeding in that regard. Um, I think the Prime Minister's Office will make an announcement on further engagement with the Saudi government over the next few days. Um, tourism is now going to become part of that engagement. The Saudis are now leading the investment for tourism in the world. Um, they've just announced together with the United Nations World Tourism Organization, they will open Open Hospitality Training Institute in Riyadh, training 25,000 hospitality workers from around the world each year. Um, so th there's a big emphasis on tourism in Saudi. You would have seen their efforts in terms of sports. Um, they've gotten the World Cup in 2034, um, golf and football and um, Formula One, and they really diversifying the economy and going in hospitality in a big way. And therefore, they have an interest in working with us. And we certainly started discussions as to how that can happen and the, the parameters of, of we working together. So um, we, we're certainly looking forward to it. <clears throat> where are we in terms of rehabilitation of the Iranara International Airport? Yeah, I think the, the Prime Minister will soon make an announcement in terms of some you know, actions that will be taken. He had alre always said that the, the work will commence early next year. As the review is done, the plans are finalized, the redesigns are finalized, and I'm, I think he will make an announcement as to when officially. Of course, work on the tower is ongoing, so work has not completely stopped, but on the superstructure, um, he did announce we're going through the process now of redesigning and making it more relevant to our needs. Um, so I think very shortly he'll make an announcement as to when work will start on that. Um, just a slight thing on the remembrance there, I don't know if there's any hard hitting thing, just remembrance that you'll take since um, we are talking about culture and stuff as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I cannot say much about it. Um, but of course, you know, as, as a country, we pay respect to all the St. Lucians who lost their lives um, during the World Wars, and especially World War II, where we will still have persons who are alive. And it's always a time for us to reflect, not just as a country and as a region, but as a world, the sacrifices people make because of wars, families and, and individuals. And it's a time for us to reflect on peace and why it is always more desirable for us to seek peace and to avoid war. Nobody wins a war. Um, and anybody who declares winner is a false declaration, really, because they would have had their losses. And you know, remembrance is a day when, as a community, a global community, we can reflect on the sacrifices that are made in pursuit of, of you know, wars and, and such actions. Just <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Started off on Saturday. Um, we can now boast in Cicero of having a top-class surface, probably the, the best um, surface in the island right now. Um, and we started off um, our football tournament on Saturday. Uh, we finished phase one of the upgrade of the Cicero playing field, phase two. We'll start over the next few months with the, putting in the lights and the seating. We're going to start also putting an outdoor gym 
and it will be a, quite a, an addition to the Cicero facility and the community, where the community can now have right there, uh, albeit outdoor, um, a complete gym. And then, of course, the final will be a small pavilion with changing rooms, because as you can imagine, um, when persons are there for activities, we need to have it. So it's a plan we've had. Um, we've worked hard, because if you knew what the surface was like before, I'm sure Ms. Lewis can tell you she lived next to the playing field. It was a clay surface, and the slightest rain means no use for a few days. Um, but now we can boast of having a top-class surface. Um, the 10 teams taking part, um, the parliamentary rep um, was very supportive. Uh, to ensure that all the teams were fully kit and you know had all they needed to take part in the tournament. We start off with a knockout competition and we'll start our league um, after the knockout. The knockout race is for warm up guys, get match feet, whatnot, and then go on to the big league um, starting shortly. I think so. I'm really excited about that project. Well, my, my question was, um, you know, not single out any particular. Yeah, well, I, I think there are multiple levels at which you deliver those issues. And issues of social deviance generally. Um, there is always the law enforcement where the institutions of the state can step in and deal with some of it. But they also to have some of the community responses you can give. Um, and only Saturday night, you know, I got a, a fuller understanding of what's involved and who's involved, at least from the, the woods around the community. Uh, and I think as a community, we need to step in and to, you know, deal with some of those issues. Uh, and I, I think I have a critical role to play in that regard. These are not interventions you put out in the news or your broadcast. It is a kind of soft uh, practice. You, you need to quietly step in and get elders to step in and other persons of leadership in the community and community leaders stepping up and, and, and you know, trying to deal with some of those problems because they can easily get out of hand and you then need to bring in the hard power, which is the police and you know, the courts and sending people to jail or whatnot. But before that, there's still space for soft power and for us to step in and have some conversations and as community leaders um, to be able to, to address some of those issues. The people judged a short time ago, but some of them are actually uh, daring you to, to call elections early. Um, yeah, well, well, you know, I like opposition, so I won't call elections early. <laughs> If we call elections early, we're going to win all the 17 seats. I, I, I don't think it's very fair for us to, after, I don't think very fair for me to just, after after I've beaten you 15 2, to come back and beat you 17 not. I don't think I'll do that. Um, but uh, as this in a previous um, press conference, how important do you think that the gathering is for, I guess, ready for, for general elections, whenever the time might be? No, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. I, I don't understand what's that, that karma for general elections, you know. General elections will come. That's not, that's not in our mind. Our focus is to develop the country. Our focus is to go into next year. Next year we have an exciting program of, 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 of infrastructure. We're going to be building more houses next year than ever was a long time in the history of St. Lucia. We're going to be fixing roads. We're going to continue work on the airport. We're going to be doing work on the seaports. Hotels are, are going to be built. We're excited about next year. So we're not going to get involved in elections just, just to win two more seats. There was some talk about Mr. Prime Minister when um, you were in opposition about the fixed election date. Um, what do you think about well, that? Well, I'm, I'm glad you're asking that. Um, I'll tell you something. You know, I have frequently said to people, especially young, intelligent journalists like you, any statement that is said, you must fact check it. You must fact check it. 
You understand? Any statement. I mean, not only fact check things that probably like a slips of, of, of the tongue, etc. Listen to me. In 2016, we formed a parliamentary review committee. We were in government, the then opposition, we were in opposition, sorry, the then government was, the then opposition was in government. We asked them to nominate two members. They refused. There was a meeting. In fact, there was a public program on NTN where they invited me and they invited the then prime minister. I was in opposition. I was cordial. I understand, I understood that the people of St. Lucia had made their decision. So I wasn't angry. I wasn't distressed. I was, I went to, to on that show. The then Attorney General, Kim Centros, was appointed to head a parliamentary the committee to look into the change of constitution of St. Lucia. She wrote me and said to me that the government never nominated their two nominees. We nominated Calix George Jr. and um, I can't remember, the, and, and Claudius Francis. We nominated them. They never nominated their, their, two, their two nominees. We came into government this time we moved to make the Caribbean Court of Justice our final appellant court. They objected. They led a failed demonstration as usual. <clears throat> you understand? But again, the people of St. Lucia had made up their mind. So St. Lucia now, to, to the great acclaim of other states, is now a member of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And I'm very proud to be the Prime Minister who, who, who calls St. Lucia to break this last... These, you know, we need to have confidence in ourselves. We are Caribbean people. We have some of the best jurists. We are Caribbean people. We are a rich civilization. So right now, we have our own jurists. Our final appellant is, uh, 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 come from our region. So we did that. We went back to cabinet. And we formed, we, we reorganized the, uh, the parliamentary committee and asked the leader of the opposition now, who was then prime minister, we asked him to nominate two people. We wrote him twice. He has not responded. You understand? So, you know, he's not responded. So your question, to come back about fixed election dates, is something that I cannot... I do not want, not I cannot, I do not want to just interfere in the Constitution piecemeal. I want to have a complete review. So that's something we are, we are, we are going to review. But the leader of, of the opposition refuses to appoint someone to sit in the parliamentary committee. And if he says that's not true, I'm going to show you the letters. Although you might say letters are not true also. Okay, um, one question for me. What do you make of, again, the opposition's claims that the health and security levy, it produces undue hardship? Have you heard that? Did you hear the leader of the, of the opposition in April 2019? You want to see the, the, cabinet, the cabinet conclusion when he formed a cabinet committee to look at health and security levy? Do you know that the leader of the opposition was in government when a security levy was actually passed? There is a law? Are you aware? that the health and security levy was passed by United Workers' Party. They actually passed a law like that. And when it came into government, we, we introduced that, so that law was out. And it's very simple, you know. If you want, gentlemen and ladies, I can show you the copy. You know, what I'm saying, you can go and you can get the law. I can ask my administrative assistant to get a copy of the law for you, for you to see it. When it was passed, who was in the he was in the in the parliament, and the Honorable Stevenson King has agreed that it was necessary at the time. The health and security levy is our investment in healthcare. You remember, you remember 
the, the opposition spoke about a health insurance. The only speak about it is a plan. The opposition are very good for plans. Talk about plans, I get the opposition first prize. You see, plans and vision, plans and vision and, 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 and renderings, I get them first prize. If you want to speak about a party with vision and plans, first prize. Delivery, zero. And that's a challenge. We have been in government for two years. I want you to take, pick up the slate before COVID. Because they you know they'll want to pretend as if COVID only hit St. Lucia. Before COVID, look at what we've achieved in our two years and look at what they achieved in their two years after COVID. Then look at their year or their two years. No, their two years before COVID, our two years. Then look at their two years after COVID and our first two years. I want you to do it. It's very simple. All the talk, the talk, the talk. The opposition actually passed the heaven security levy. It was, it was in the books. They actually passed it. And I will, I've instructed my, my administrative assistant to get it for you. For you to read it for yourself. So you don't be saying, and that, um, that's, that's what I'm saying. They passed it. They had, it was important. And Stevenson King, the senior minister, has admitted in the parliament that he was prime minister when it was passed, but it was passed because it was necessary at the time. And this is why he's supporting it now. And also there was um, some complaints about gas prices and which have one of the highest um, gas prices in the region. And because we have 150, because we have a 150 tax that they pass. Mm. You understand? You must, you see, gentlemen and ladies, I don't, I never want to tell the press what to do. Never. I never want to tell the press what to do. Never. I will never do that. But you know, it's very important that we look at facts. It's not, not perception, not what men and women see in their mouth. Facts. The last government wants to put a 150. They put it. They don't want to put it, you know. And they don't want to pass a health, a health levy. Tell me something. What tangible steps, ask your question, did the government take for health insurance? Plans. Talk. Somebody said... Everybody would have a card for hundred thousand dollars. Another person said, "You, you, I don't think you remember these things, you know. You don't, you know what you did for, for for universal healthcare. We have already begun to implement it. That's the difference. We implement. We don't talk about it. We don't criticize. We don't call people's names. We implement. And that's the difference between us and them. As we speak, hotels are being built." Hotels are not being planned. Some are planned, but hotels are being built, constructed, go on the site. You'll see workmen. We, we, we're not, you're not going to see pictures. What tangible steps are taken towards DSH? What, what did you see on the ground before COVID? But everything is plans. Everything is planned, what we planned. What we have vision to do. Vision is important, but vision must come with action. Prisoners, there's no place to put arrested persons. We're building the custody suites now. We're building it. Go there, you see it. It's going to be built. So the police will no longer have to drive people all over the place when they arrest them and drop them. We're building it. We, we, the the growth of the police station, we are building it. We're not talking about it. We're building it. The view of what the Viewfort Division Headquarters. We're building it. We're doing it. It's good. People can see it. Go to, to, to Wyndham. You'll see a hotel being built. You're going to see it being built. You understand? The same way you're going to see GPH. You'll see it. That's the difference between us and them. Next year, you're going to see houses. You're going to see the roads be, being repaired. You will see it. You understand? We are in November. <coughs> You're in November. And you see, I've made it my duty not to respond to what comes out on the other side. Because if I do that, I'm going to lose focus. So I don't listen. I don't listen to what the other side says. I don't listen to it. Because what they say, if the opposition <coughs> would have come to us 
and talk about policy. And say, listen to me, you're going this way, let's go that way. But what I heard in the, in the, is insults, innuendo. I heard one of them calling me names and, and talking about and, and <laughs> racism, color. I, you know, hey, Dory, you know, these things, I can't get involved in that. We have to, we have a country to develop. Have you noticed what's happening with young people in this country as far as business development is concerned? You know the hundreds of young people who are doing businesses, who are doing, who are making creams, who are making, who, the excitement that's involved. And by the way, we have a new CEO at the, at the youth economy. You're going to meet him at some point. You understand? Yes. Um, the Venezuelan ambassador last Friday, she reiterated the Venezuelan government's position when it comes to the whole conflict between um, that country and Guyana. Um, I guess calling also for direct talks between the uh, Prime Minister and Ali and Nicolas Maduro. Um, what is San Lucia's position? San Lucia's position is a carry composition. We are seeking a Personally, I'm friends to both the Prime Minister of Guyana and the Prime Minister of, and the President of, of Venezuela. We're friends. We speak to each other. You understand? But our position is our region must be a zone of peace. We don't want any conflicts in our region. So the carry composition is St. Lucia's position. We stick into the carry composition. But I have very good relationships with both of, of these people and St. Lucia's relationships with both of these countries. Yes. Yesterday I spoke to the Venezuelan ambassador and the, the fertilizer should be should be here anytime. And the minister of the deputy, the deputy prime minister was speaking to her this morning about the, the flights from Venezuela to but things are, are in place. And the housing we're supposed to have a model house in the country very shortly. The president of Venezuela keeps his word and he's very he's he wants it to happen. So and I want to tell you something that you you're going to um, I, I haven't even told my cabinet. The president of Ghana is going to be our guest for independence next year. He's going to be our special guest for independence next year. The government of the president of, of Ghana. Yes. Um, yes. Um, the British High Commissioner was in Saint Lucia last week. Oh, yes. 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 So um, he said he had some discussions with you, and he had an engagement with us. One of the things that came out was that. Um, he had expressed that he, and I think by extension the UK government, was not too pleased with um, the Millennium Highway project. I see. Both of you all, yeah, well, he said that. Um, what happened in those talks? What, what was... You see, you know, it's like, it's like the Grosley Highway. Are you aware? Are you aware? Are you aware, for the food time, that there was... A signed loan for the construction of the Grozy Highway? Are you aware that the Shock Bridge, there was a plan verified by the Army Corps of Engineers and financed by the World Bank for the construction of the Shock Bridge? Are you aware of that? Are you aware that the Bois Bridge? That they made, they, they created, they, they tried to cast all aspersions upon me on it. Do you know the Balonge Bridge? There were actually cost savings of $300,000. And the Balonge Bridge was built, was built on gl global competitive tendering for the whole world. And the firms, got it was a solution firm, was in league with a firm from. Colombia, they are the ones who built the, 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 the Bois-Lange Bridge and there was actual cost savings. And are you aware that the road next to it, which we need to, we need to utilize, was built at $3 million direct award? Direct award by the same people who are speaking? Are you aware of that? So let's get back to what you asked me. Yeah, I, was just, I, was just asking, I was just asking, what was, what was, what was the conversations like with him as it related to that, to that project? Because he did say, you know, understand the people for the Yes. You see, the Millennium Highway. Let me give you the story of the Millennium Highway. Because I, but I want you to report it. I will. Tell your, 
I want you to tell your producer to report it. You're you're not you're not reporting it, comrade. Please and let your your let your 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 head. I know because you listen to me. You know, you know I used to work in a newsroom. You know, I, yes, I used to work in a newsroom. So I understand what, what you're saying. I used to work in a newsroom, in a newsroom, you understand? And then one of St. Lucia's famed journalists, um, he used to have some time for me before. You understand? So I know what happens in, in the, I always tell me, I know what happens in the newsroom. I used to work there. You understand? I know what happens in the newsroom. So I know you, you have all the good intentions in the world. When you, talk, you say, nah, not that. I know that. <clears throat> and now let's go. Do you know that we had already secured finance for OPIC, for the Millennium Highway. You know what? Yes. I know you, I, I, you, you, you look amazed. Finance had already been secured for the Millennium Highway. From since Calix George was Minister of Infrastructure, he had, he had devised that plan for a roundabout in the Millennium Highway. Since Calix George, Minister of Agriculture, of Infrastructure. OPIC had financed that road, financed it. Agreed? Good. Together with the highway and together with feeder roads for agriculture. When I'm talking about roads, the QAT fund, feeder roads, I think there were 20 feeder roads. And I can give you the list. I can ask her to get a list for you of the roads that were funded by the QATs for improvement. The roads that were funded, the roads that you see, you hear them talking about now. When they came into government, they abandoned all of that. And they used the money that Kenny Anthony had negotiated with the British, with Prime Minister Cameron. That money, Jamaica used it for the some funds, and we, we wanted to use it for what is called a Chimere Royale, which would be a road coming from the north to the south, a highway. Truth be told, there was not enough money in that grant to do it. It was a grant, grant funding. We already had, the Skyball Development Bank had already done a feasibility study. We invited the then parliamentary representative for Castro Southeast. We invited him. I want to listen to these things carefully, you know, because people seem to be forgetting the history. We invited the parliamentary bit for Castries office to a meeting at the Bexon Primary School. There were two or three meetings. I went to one because I don't interfere in the business of technocrats. I don't pretend to be an engineer. I don't pretend to be a commissioner, to be a policeman. I don't pretend what I did at school, that's what I am. My job is to create the, the enabling environment for the government's policy to, to happen. We invited him. He came to the meeting. He expressed his views. We also invited him to a meeting to deal with the flooding in Bexon. He expressed his views. <clears throat> then, when they came into government, they abandoned that plan. And they decided to use that money to do the Millennium Highway and the West Coast. We were the ones who negotiated the bridge. So the idea was the OPIC would fund the highway, go into the roundabout, connect to the bridge, and go, and go to the West Coast. They said no. They were the ones who did all the bidding processes for the Millennium Highway. They were the ones who did all the arrangements for the Millennium Highway. Not this government. They were the ones who started the Millennium Highway. And when we came into government, we continued. So the Millennium Highway problem started from them. But of course, we can't blame them. What we say is that things are the Millennium Highway. We are not satisfied, and the British are not satisfied, and we are asking that all the parties do better. I am told that they are going to be doing better. Because I agree, the public of St. Lucia is suffering because of that. So I agree. I'm not making any excuses. I agree. So the British and I stand on the same vein as that. Just this my final question. Um, I think the, the UN recently reported that this year would be 
always what appears to be the warmest um, of the year. Um, I know you were someone who has always um, advocated and spoke about the whole climate change and this not and whatnot. But when we speak about national development, I know when I speak of climate resilience, we typically speak about hurricanes and whatnot. Will there also be some consideration about the heat and how that may factor in, into our sure. development plans? In, in fact, in terms of production, because you know, there are very there are some global issues that we tend to be just playing around with. You know, a discussion has been that sometimes it gets so hot that we will not be able to work outside. Eh? And then that's a discussion that leads to our productivity. You know, we have some serious issues to deal with, you know, instead of people being selfish and fighting for power. There are some serious issues that every government will have to deal with. Every government. The cost of living, every government has to deal with it. Don't worry with, with, with the rhetoric you heard on the other side. Every government will have to deal with the cost of living. Every government has to deal with climate change. Every government has to be, be deal with the, the deviant behavior in this country. Every government. So if you, you get back to the, to the climate change and the heat, if you notice, and let's talk about roads. Yesterday, there was some potholing. As soon as the guy started, Rain began to fall. Although I heard say one of them say, I'm the one that made the place hot. So, you want to believe, you want to believe somebody can say that on a political platform? You want to believe if I'd ever said so, what, 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 what would happen? <clears throat> Anyhow, they said I'm the one that makes the place hot. I'm the one. It's because of labor, there's heat. You know I mean? <clears throat> so that goes, but you heard it yourself, comrades. <clears throat> um, that's, what they, <laughs> that's what they said. And that's what, you think I can ever be on a platform and a man say that? And I don't, and, and 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 I won't pull him up. But there's cohesion. All of them say the same thing. All of them. It's a matter of, it's a matter of just throw dirt, throw it, throw it, throw dirt. Say anything. Call him names. Say what you know about him. And say, let's see. And then I heard sometimes the one of them say, God, God chooses the leaders, but God didn't choose me. <laughs> I mean, you know, these are the things that pass for politics in Lucia, You know, yes, you heard so. I mean, <laughs> that's what they said. That is what somebody said on a platform. They said that God chooses leaders, but God didn't choose me. So, we are dealing, and that is why, and again, if you remember history, when we built the Bois Bridge, it was the first climate resistant bridge that was built. We built it to deal with one in a thousand year events. So, we used special material on that bridge. And the consultant they had for that bridge was a consultant they chose. And you see, and that is why I can be so confident, you know, because history is on my side. That's why I can be so confident. That's why all the shots they throw at me, I can deal with it because history is on my side. Truth is on my side. We, when we built the Baldwin Bridge, it, we said it was the first climate resistant bridge that has been built in, in, in this country. They criticized it. They said it was corruption. They had about three or four audits. One of them who is writing was an auditor. They came out and found that we had cost savings on the bridge. Because as I say, I don't interfere in these things. I don't interfere in these things. So back to the climate is question. So what are you going to do as a government? Is we're going to ensure that we build back better. So in the roads that are going to be built, we're going to build back better to ensure these things happen. But in terms of productivity, we have a lot of issues when coming here. Because if you notice, it rains one, one minute, next, next minute is hot. One day is very hot, and the other day is all the rain. And that has impact on our productivity and impact on our infrastructure plan. Can you confirm um, whether someone has been identified to be the special prosecutor? You know, the special prosecutor is chosen by the legal and judicial commission. When the time comes, an appropriate announcement will be made. And also, the deputy prime minister um, announced that you will be making some pronouncements as, as it pertains to the year in our international airport project. Um, can you give us any insight as to that yet? Um, the year international airport, as I said yesterday, we are going to continue. We are going to, right now, we are building the tower. The tower has been built now. But <clears throat> we could not, in good conscience, as I said yesterday, I could not put the people of St. Lucia on a billion dollar debt. I could not. My conscience would not allow it. I could not. You understand? 
and I will not. We have decided on the way forward. For report. And right now, what is being prepared is a bill of quantities. But you must understand also, and again, I want you to note these things. The largest contract in St. Lucia was given by Director Ward. The largest contract in St. Lucia. And in that contract, every payment that goes out, apart from the interest rate, there is another fee on that payment. So the interest rate for that contract, before the rise in interest rates, is in double digits. That, 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 these are the financial arrangements that I inherited. And these are things we, that we must answer. Because people are pretending that they were never in government. So, what we're doing now is that we have to enter in, into negotiations. We haven't started, but we're going to in, in, into negotiations with the present contractor, who was legally appointed by Direct Award, to, and, we have, and he's a Taiwanese contractor, associated with the Taiwanese government. We are friends with the Taiwanese government. So we're going to enter into negotiations to look at the way forward. But what's been prepared now is a bill of quantities for the new terminal building. But work on the, the control tower is happening now. I just completed a, a, a meeting. I, I'm in Trinidad and Tobago that was scheduled, that took place on the 6th to the 11th of November, addressing the Caribbean the Commonwealth Caribbean Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. And as you know, this program has been in existence for over 50 years. And we have many St. Lucians who go to the Canadian farm to work. And so far, every year, the, the, the employers, the farm owners, the Canadian government, and the representatives from the different governments in the Caribbean that are participating in the program do meet to discuss um, collective agreement in terms of the conditions under which the workers work in Canada, the, the, the rate of pay, and other areas that can improve the situation for them. One of the big um, takeaway we had for this last meeting was the provision of dryers and laundry services to the workers. And as you know, Canada, there are times when the weather is very cold. And even if the workers wash their clothes, it would not dry quickly in the absence of dryer. So we agreed that um, the, um, the, the farm owners have to provide dryer in the accommodation that is given to the workers. Or if they do not have dryers installed, they are supposed to give them laundry fees and transportation to a laundry area so that they can get their clothes cleaned, washed and dry at least once a week. And that was a major um, benefit for us, a major gain in that last meeting, because they had been negotiating for this for a while, and some farm owners did not provide that facility. So you find when the workers wash their clothes because it's very cold, it takes how many days before it's dry, and therefore that created some discomfort for them. There was also concern about um, workers who actually leave the farm and go into the society. And it is one that we need to address, especially within the OECS. Um, some persons who do go on the farm, and they, maybe at the end of their program, they do not return to St. Lucia or to the other islands. So this is something we have to address so that we prepare the workers. We felt that there was not enough preparation for the workers before they go on the farm. Some people just want to go on the farm. But now we'll have to put mechanisms in place to prepare them psychologically, to prepare them to adapt to the new environment, and let them know that this is a contribution they are making not just to the, the food security in Canada, but also creating employment and livelihood for um, the people in their respective countries. That program actually generates about 21 million um, US dollars per year in terms of returns coming to the countries, the OEC. Mm -hmm. Just to switch pages just a little bit, what I could remember asking you some time ago about um, the Department of Human Services and if they're, well, if they're given enough allocations or whatever to do the 
uh, problems of society. Just recently we saw videos circulating with women fighting with a child on her, all kind of drama, just a bunch of drama. Um, just um, your thoughts and sentiments on, on these issues as it pertains to society now and what do you think can really be done, if anything can be done to really address and alleviate some of these fights? Um, well, there has been a kind of decline in human relations in the society generally. And I think sometimes we may attribute that to access to information and technology. Now we live in a global village. Before, you only saw things when you reached there. You only hear things when you are next to it. But now with the um, advent of technology, you have the whole world at your disposal. And therefore, you have cross-cultural um, practices where certain things that are norms, beliefs, and values of our society, we get this transmitted to our society unknowing to us because our children, the people in our society, have access to that information. And therefore, they will choose the easier way out in terms of what they think is best for them and not, not what we advocate in our society. So therefore, there is that trend of a breakdown in the whole um, social fabric of our society. And therefore, we have to use the same means now to promote positive values. We have to go aggressively with the technology so that we promote the good things, the, the, the better way of doing things. Because our children, our young people are exposed to a lot of the negative things in the social environment. You have access to the internet and everything else at the tip of a finger. And that was not there many years ago. So it is one that requires a lot more robust action, more vigilance on the part of government. It will require a lot more investment for us to address these issues. Um, the investigation into the escaped convicts from Bordeaux, has that concluded as yet? And no, it is still ongoing, but they have him back behind bars. And therefore, we await what the, the judge will rule on that as to whether it will require um, some stiffer penalty for the inmate for having violated the, the law and trying to escape um, custody. Mm -hmm. Also, the missing firearm from um, the um, senior correctional officer's firearms that went missing. Well, that has been in the public domain, and I know you are fully aware of that. But um, at the correctional facility, they are taking measures now to ensure that it is not on the premises and then to do what is necessary on how that firearm can be recovered or how do we deal with the situation. But it is currently actively under investigation. Mm -hmm. While we are on BCF, um, there were some concerns about some drones being flown around in the area. I remember last, when the Correctional Services Association spoke about it, they mentioned it in one of the Please or whatnot, but um, are you aware of any situation whether there are drones hovering over the prison or anything of that nature? Is there any is there anything that can be confirmed or denied? Uh, well, we don't have anything concrete on this matter. What I know we have been doing when it comes to the Bordenley Correctional Facility is to tighten security, and you would have known that um, the fencing around Bordenley, which is almost 20 years, was almost falling apart. And therefore, the government has invested over $5 million to put in new fencing that is more durable and long-lasting. And the process right now, as we speak, is ongoing. So it is one that um, we want to restrict uh, movement close to the facility. Now, with regards to the drones, we have also increased security measures at Bordelais with cameras that can pick up things that are happening there that the government invested heavily in. So we know that it is, will be possible for security persons at the prison to pick up any strange movement or objects in that vicinity. So we are addressing that problem. Mm -hmm. um, on, the, on, the Final yeah, on the labor front, how active is the labor tribunal? Because I, I think uh, it was early, early this year, it was at some event, I'm not sure. Public service, you know, you had made some statements that there were some outstanding uh, cases at the Labour Tribunal. So I want to know, has there been any 
cutting down that number has those things been heard they deliberate like well i have not received an official report from them but what i know they have been meeting in fact right now they have some challenges which we are trying to address in terms of creating a permanent space for them to conduct the hearings and some persons have gotten results from the cases and some are still outstanding but so far the tribunal has been trying its best to address some of the issues that have been there in fact when they did assume position there was over 57 cases that were there um, in waiting for hearing but since then um, with the new labor commissioner he has and together with the other labor officers they have been able to clear a lot of the issues so they do not really refer all these cases to the tribunal so that ha there has been a reduction in the number of cases that have been submitted to the tribunal. So in the meantime, they are trying to clear the backlog that is there. Yeah, but I guess this will have some implications if the full selection stuff happening now. Hmm? This will have some implications with the strike moving for loose select like voters. Um, have you heard about the... Um, right, but the strike, the proposed strike for loose select like workers, that matter has been referred to the tribunal. So in, in that light, the, you cannot proceed with action if it is before the tribunal. So they have welcomed the idea and they said they are willing to go to the tribunal to resolve the matter.